Sunday morning a.m. Problem passages are tongues for all corporate tongues. So um, I look forward to bringing this particular one in this series. Um, if I believe that when Jesus said, it's better for you that I go away so the helper will come, the comforter, the helper. When he came, the presentation form, the presenting form were tongues of fire, sound of a rushing mighty wind, and clearly tongues. They were enabled by the Holy Spirit for tongues. It is my hope and intention that the result of this, this 45, min <coughs> 45 minutes, that you will be stimulated to pray in tongues more and that we as a congregation, our faith will grow in the corporate use of tongues. So the intention is not just the corporate use of tongues, but individually. I hope that one of the characterizations of this congregation is those are people, you know, they pray in tongues. They pray in tongues while they ride in their car, while they're working, while they're trying to figure out their income tax. <clears throat> Those people just pray in tongues. May we be accused of that. Um, so problem passages. Are there any difficult passages to deal with? Uh, because there are a lot of people in good conscience in our country, in our culture especially, that really, really, really feel in good conscience and not trying to be bad guys, bad gals. They just don't believe tongues are for them or tongues are for today or tongues are for corporate use. They really, really genuinely don't believe that and there are passages of scripture that they rely upon. So here we go. I have uh, this question. <clears throat> I believe the problem with understanding 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 is in some measure the frame of reference. It's misunderstanding what it really is even talking about. What was being addressed? Now, if someone has the uh, preconceived idea that tongues uh, is bad and not for today, then with that pair of glasses that you put on, this is not for today, this is passed away. Of course, when you read that passage, you'll read it through the light of you're convinced this is what has happened, it's not available. Or if you wear the pair of glasses that Paul basically was quite upset with uh, the church in Corinth and tongues, and he was trying to get them to minimize the use of tongues, then those pair of glasses, you'll wear those glasses. And uh, through the years, I have found th that the verse that is relied upon the most that I am personally convinced, hopefully not pridefully, I'm sure pride is mixed in in, in significant dimensions, that it's just a significant misunderstanding and misapplication of what that verse is even talking about at all. And I believe that the church is stripped, especially in the Western world, the church is stripped of one of its greatest intercessory prayer resources, and that is praying in tongues, praying in the Spirit. So what is being spoken of? A frame of reference. So I want to use this as a practical illustration. If you don't really have a grasp of the frame of reference, then how you would interpret it can be so widely different. So I have made this up. So I'm talking about a game that a ball is used. Please don't shout out, but what game am I talking about? Well, there's not enough information. I mean, there could be dozens or hundreds of games. Number two, please, don't, uh, please follow me with this on the screen, and especially don't give the last slide. Number two, the ball may be thrown. Okay, well, there's lots of games. You could do football. You could do baseball. You could do rugby. You could do... Um, I mean, there are many, 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 and it eliminates some, but there's many things where the ball may be thrown. Number three is the ball may be caught. Okay, there's lots of games where uh, you play and the ball can be caught. The ball can be thrown, the ball can be caught. That doesn't identify a particular one. Number, th number four, uh, the ball may be carried. Okay, that's uh, football, you can carry the ball. Basketball, you can carry the ball. Someone said, no, you can't. Yes, you can. You're allowed to carry it for one and a half steps, uh, you know, if you're driving for the basket. Uh, you can carry the ball. Well, you know, you can carry the ball in football. In rugby, you can carry the ball. Uh, in soccer, the goalie can carry the ball. The, go the ball can be carried. So, okay, so, uh, up to the, the ball may be hidden. Well, how is that? You can try and disguise football. They try and disguise the ball. Volleyball, they try and disguise. Sometimes they set people in front so you don't know where the serve is. There's lots of games where uh, the ball may be hidden. The ball must remain in bounds. Well, that covers probably all of them. The ball has to, you know, what sport am I talking about? 
uh, or the ball may, be, may hit the ground. Basketball, the ball can hit the ground. Football, the ball can hit the ground. Bounce, fumble, you can hit the ground. You can get up and run with it. There's lots of games. Soccer, the ball hits the ground. So th then you could say, well, it must be talking about soccer, you know, because soccer would apply to all of those. Uh, or anyone might move with the ball. Anyone might move with the ball. Still is football a fumble. Anybody can pick up a fumble. Basketball, anybody can pick up the ball and or have the ball pass them and they can move with the ball. Rugby, anybody can. I mean, it just goes on and on. Or points are scored with the ball. Okay. So do you know what's being talked about yet with such a certainty that you're willing to risk everything? I don't think so. And there's many options. Uh, multiple players are on each team. Okay, so that eliminates ping pong, and ping pong got eliminated several back, you know, because you have multiple players on the team. Well, basketball's still in, football's still in, soccer's still in, uh, rugby is still in. Uh, so the, the ball may be tossed with one or two hands. Well, boss, basketball, you can do that. Uh, football, you can do that. A shovel pass, you can do it with two hands. Uh, soccer, the goalie can throw, you, uh, th and an inbound, you can throw it with two hands. The goalie can throw it with one hand. The ball may be thrown with one. Well, you don't know. Would you risk everything? Would you risk your future? Would you risk your standing uh, as an individual uh, that you could say, I know of a certainty what the game is. No. But it's my opinion, that's how 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 are approached. Not really understanding what in the world is the real essence of what's being addressed. And, and, and tongues are not an enemy. Uh, the ball may be tossed hard or easy. That means you can throw the ball hard. I mean, dodgeball. I think you'll find that dodgeball almost would cover every one of these that I've talked about so far. A uh, baseball can be just tossed real gentle. A baseball can be thrown hard. Baseball, basketball, football can be an easy pass, can be a hard pass. Uh, it, may be illegal, it may be illegal to carry the ball. The goalie can carry the ball in soccer, but other people can't carry the ball. The ball can be carried in basketball. The ball can be carried in baseball. It may be illegal in different times in different settings. Do you have enough that you're willing to risk everything for? I don't think so. Uh, the ball may bounce and still be in play. Uh, you can do basketball, you can do baseball, you can do football on an onside kick. The ball can bounce and still be in play. I mean, there's lots of games. So do you know of certainty? But if you don't know what the game is, meaning by that, if you don't, what is really going on, then fitting all those in is you can come up with a whole variety of options. And number 15, knocking someone down can be legal. You can do that in a lot of sports. You can do it in baseball. If you're going home and the, and the catcher is standing in the way and he doesn't have the ball, you can run into him. The point is that this is what I believe is going on, in, especially in the Western culture, with misinterpreting, for whatever reason, what 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 are really about. What's the intent? Number 15, or 16, a 10-foot high basket is the goal. Ah, it's basketball. That's what it's about. It's about basketball. So then you go back and you can apply all the things that have been said up to this point in time. Personal conclusions, these are personal conclusions that I have come to, and it's the beginning of the teaching of the subject I've tried to bring us to a point of focus. Number one, Acts and 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 12 through 14 are addressing, are addressing about, uh, you didn't write that very well, Russ, are addressing uh, uh, two different coins, heads and tails. You could say, well, heads and tails, it is my opinion they're very different coins. 1 Corinthians 12 through 14 addresses the body, the body of Christ, which is global, which, it, which encompasses everybody, the church, which is a very clear distinction that's addressed, especially in chapter 14. The end of chapter 12 is the assembly, it's the ecclesia. So the whole body does not come together in the ecclesia because it's who's gathered in one place. 
but it includes the widest sweep addressing the body of Christ and the distribution of gifts in the body of Christ and the distribution and use of gifts in the ecclesia, the assembly. In one sense, it's the same coin. It's the corporate entity of the body of Christ, be it globally the body, be it locally the church, the ecclesia, the assembly. The second is individual and corporate prayer. If you look in the book of Acts, uh, when the baptism of the Holy Spirit was poured out individually, they all received Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 19. They all received. They all spoke in tongues. It was very corporate. Acts chapter 2, it was everybody speaking publicly in an upper room in a public setting. In Acts chapter, um, in Acts chapter 9, where Paul would receive the Holy Spirit, we find out later, he said, I pray in tongues more than you all. Tongues was something he did a lot. Acts chapter 10, when uh, to Cornelius and the Italian band, it was poured out, they all spoke in tongues. It was very corporate. Acts chapter 19, when Paul was uh, visiting the church at Ephesus and he found 12 disciples and he asked them, did they receive the Holy Spirit since they believed? They said they didn't even hear about it. All 12, there were about 12 there. They all received, they all spoke in tongues. It was very individual. It was very corporate. I believe it's a huge mistake to, to neglect the information of the book of Acts and trying to understand what is really being addressed in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. I have, I, uh, from your opinion, I don't know what the most controversial thing is that I do or have done. Uh, I probably would be shocked if I heard all of your opinion, what's the most controversial. Uh, and I'd be real depressed and I might, um, I don't know, feel bad, uh, feel real bad. I believe leading the congregation to pray in tongues on occasion corporately is the most, uh, is the most controversial thing that I do. I would have thought renewal and guiding the congregation as it was during times of renewal, that that absolutely would uh, ostracize me from the pastors in the city, but it is not. But leading the congregation to pray in tongues, years ago I actually had a pastoral visitation. A number of very respected pastors in the city met with me because they were so concerned about uh, what I was doing with the congregation in terms of uh, publicly having us pray in tongues. I do believe it's the most vulnerable thing, but I, these are the reasons why I do it. In that sense, I am risking everything and have been for years. Um, number two. <clears throat> so uh, that, that's a personal conviction that what is being addressed in Acts, all the way through the book of Acts, and what the point of 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, they're talking about different things. One, I believe, is the personal prayer language that is available to everybody who receives the helper. It's a language. It's an intercessory prayer language. It's for everybody. When the body of Christ gathers together in the church, it is not intended for everybody to address everybody else gathered in tongues for the intention of addressing the people who were there. Paul was addressing them and saying, you got it all mixed up. They were all doing it. He said, you don't understand. That's not how gifts are dispersed in the body. That's not how they're utilized in the church. But it is how it's utilized individually because Jesus was saying, if he implied only some of you are going to get the helper and the resources of the helper, especially the presenting resource, it would be where's the hope? I hope I fall into that category of getting that particular resource that's available. Number, my, my, my personal conclusion is they are addressing two different coins. They're not heads and tail of the same coin, so to speak. You might say it differently. Um, and that number, number two is what they could do was not consistent with what they should be doing. 1 Corinthians 14, which Paul deals with it directly, 
you have to have this as an understanding. What they could do was not consistent with what they should be doing. In Paul's eloquent arguments where he was trying to convince the church at Corinth, stop the practice that you've been doing, he never argued from the standpoint, this is impossible because all of you can't be speaking in tongues because tongues is not for everybody. Therefore, you really can't be doing this. But they were. They were. They were misusing a resource that they did have available to them that was so beneficial to them, they were thinking, I don't know, it seems to me. They were thinking, this is so beneficial to me, I'm going to address you and I hope it's as beneficial for you as it is for me or I have found it to be so for me. It was the misuse of a valid enabling. It never is argued you can't be doing that because not everybody can speak in tongues. That was never an argument. Number three, conclusion. God is to be the focus, not people. Almost all the time, unless you have been prompted, and that's part of the gifting, the diverse tongues that have been given to you, is to address, um, to address the assembly, the ecclesia, with an interpretation. If that's the case, you are speaking to the people. But apart from that, tongues is largely, it's prayer. It is prayer to God. It, the focus is to be on God, not people. The mistake that they were making was, at Corinth was they were focusing on people. They were taking a Godward focused resource and focusing on people. If you understand that, then as you read through, as we read through in a moment, 1 Corinthians 14, it's like that's as clear as can be. He was explaining why this is not the resource that you use the way you're using it. God is to be the focus, not people almost all the time in terms of you may be praying about people to God, about people, but you're not trying to teach people just by speaking in tongues. You're not trying to pray a prayer that you want them to understand and say amen and be moved by without prayer and interpretation. God is to be the focus. That's not what was happening. People were the focus. And Paul was saying, in essence, this is wrong. Number four, personal conviction. Paul was not personally against the use of tongues. In chapter 14, he makes it very clear. I thank my God, I speak in tongues more than you all. It's an interesting study to look at the life of Paul. He was such a vibrant example of a, uh, of a man sold out, a, a member of the body of Christ, sold out to the purposes of God in Christ Jesus. And, you know, what was the secret of his success? What was it that was enabling him to accomplish the things he did? Well, one way you can begin to get an idea about that is you can say, well, what is it by his own testimony he did a lot of? Maybe you can get a hint from, well, he did a lot of this, he did a lot of that. We do that in the life of Jesus, and there's three things that I know of that Paul said, I do a lot of. One is, he said, I pray in tongues more than you all. The implication, especially if you read out of the Amplified Version, is more than the whole bunch of people put together. I pray in tongues more than all of you put together. That means he was praying in tongues an incredible amount of time. But he said, in church, I'd rather only utter five words in tongues than ten thousands or thousands of words in whatever their language was so I could teach you. He was not opposed to tongues. Can you imagine that? One individual than what was known as a tongue-speaking congregation. He individually, personally, was speaking in tongues more than all of them put together. He was not against tongues. That is not the intent of this passage. 
uh, number five, or this section of Scripture, the corporate use of prayer in tongues has been largely minimized or eliminated in the Western church. Now, I was raised in the Western church. I can remember the first time I went to Guatemala, which I think was the very first time I was in a service where everybody prayed at the same time. I just about freaked out. I couldn't believe it. I think they were all praying in Spanish, but it was like, this is bewildering. I thought such thoughts as, this is not right. I mean, how's God going to, I really thought this, how's God going to understand all these people in the room praying in tongues at the same time? I forgot about the one billion people in the earth who are all praying at this point in time, or maybe it's only 500 million that are praying at this point in time, or maybe it's only 25 million at this instant around the whole globe are praying. It's no problem for God to understand that. But I did. I really did think at that time, this is confusing. God doesn't even know what's being said. Oh, my goodness. A doctrine, that, but historical. We, we just say the corporate use, is so it, it's historical. That was intended to get the, the jump start, the church. No, the blood of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That birthed the church. The blood of Jesus accepted on the, of the real mercy seat. That birthed the church. The helper came. That was the presentation of the helper. And it was like God didn't want us to miss it. He's a consoler. He's an intercessor. He wants to console you. He wants to intercede in you, through you. He wants you to humble yourself and use your voice and permit him to intercede for you, through you. It's not a doctrine. It's a way we live life. It's an unpracticed practice. And this is what happens lots of times is as a result of how it's addressed, it's an unpracticed practice. It's something we believe in, but do you practice it? Corporately, do you practice it? Individually, do you pra in your family, do you practice it? With your spouse, do you practice it? Or is it an unpracticed practice or an unpracticed doctrine that we have? And my intention is not to put you down or make you feel bad. I can think of thousands of times that I haven't led Faye and I to pray in tongues, and I can think of many times that I have. And I know some of you have. You, you pray a lot together. It's a phenomenal resource. When the helper came, it was the presenting form. It is my intention to try and set, you're facing trouble, pray in tongues. You're in a financial crisis, pray in tongues. You're facing, you're needing a job, pray in tongues. You don't know what to do about a neighbor next door, pray in tongues. You have been wronged, pray in tongues. What about the government? Pray in tongues. There's no limit. Do you need help? You're in a boat, you're out in the sea, and you don't know what to do, pray in tongues. Your car is broken down. You're beside the road. What do you do? Pray in tongues. Uh, number six, agreement and faith in using corporate prayer in tongues or praying the scriptures. I see two of the most powerful corporate prayer resources. Praying the scriptures, praying in tongues are two of the very most powerful and unifying tools given to the body of Christ, the church. So I go back to Genesis chapter 11. Genesis 11 is when there were languages and they were just in essence, the essence of all the diversity of language. They were all speaking the same thing prior to that. It was the accusation, the realization, the declaration that God made when he came down and recognized what was taking place in the earth. They're all saying the same thing. I do believe that if the corporate global church would pray in tongues together, in faith, we haven't even begun to see what's available to the church. If we use the resource, the prayer resource that God has given us, that Jesus poured out, it was, in essence, the promised gift, enabling that he was given the privilege of upon the resurrection and the presenting of his blood, entering into the Father's presence and being accepted, that he did the work of redemption. He was given the promise, and he poured it out. What a gift. And it is so despised. 
Genesis 11, it was corporate. They were all speaking the same thing. We want to build a city. We want to build a tower. We're going to build it out of this. They agreed what the process was. We're going, we're going to be a people of prayer. We're going to pray the scriptures. We're going to pray in tongues. As inspired by God, we're going to pray what's inspired by God. Um, I generally, I'm a pastor, and I've done it. I, uh, one of the things I, just, I, di I, I enjoy the least is going to pastor's prayer meetings because you, you discover many pastors, what they preach the Sunday before that because that was real close, and that's what they pray. They pray you the outline. They pray you the scriptures. They remind God of what the Bible says in terms of giving an outline. And it's like, you know, they're talking to us. They're not talking to God. I would much rather, why don't we just all pray in tongues? Why don't we just humble ourselves and pray in tongues and say, you pick the subject, you pick the words. It doesn't mean every prayer meaning that that's all what people do, but I've been a part of so many where I feel like, there and I. I come in and out of seasons where I feel like, I'm talking to the people, I'm not praying. Now, Lord, I want you to remind the people to be good and to make sure they walk the dog the appropriate number of times this week and that they do so and so. In Jesus' name, amen. And what we're doing is we're finishing the message and giving you our concluding points. It's not prayer. So I think what a phenomenal resource that's been. It bypasses all of our opinions, all of our mixed-up doctrines. It bypasses all of that. But I don't know what I'm saying. That's the good part. It takes faith. But Genesis 11, it was so corporate. Acts 2, it was corporate. Everybody was. Acts 8, I believe it was tongues, but you can't say that emphatically. I can say I believe it was. Can you prove it? I can't prove it because I've touched on that. Acts 10, they were all speaking in tongues. Acts 19, it was corporate. Ephesians 6, if you look at the concept of warfare, especially all the way through the Old Testament, it was not one person. Yes, individually, every individual person had to deal with the enemy. But it was very corporate. They would go out as an army. The, um, the armor that's found in Ephesians chapter 6, yes, that is for individuals. That's what we put on individually. But we act like all of the warfare is individual. It's not all individual. It's corporate. We all can put on the helmet and the breastplate and the loins girt with truth and the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We all can pick up the shield of faith. We all can take the sword of the Spirit, praying with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. It is not just an, um, uh, an individual exercise, the resources, the armor of God, the might of God. It's where do you find its expression so much that God said, I've got to come down and change the rules because what they are capable of now, because there was such agreement, unity, harmony. And so for me, it's such a key element to understand for me that Genesis 11, the, uh, the, redemptive, um, the redemptive recovery available to mankind from what was wrong in Genesis 11 was Acts chapter 1 and 2, and it was the release of, that calls for faith, humility and faith, it calls for. That's what tongues calls for. It's so corporate. And, but that is the point where, especially in the Western culture, I remember I would ask different pastors in Russia, I would get their permission, I would like to lead, we'd go do conferences and stuff like that, I'd like to lead the people, and so many people were born again in those conferences, it wasn't just the church. I'd say, would it be okay if I would lead the people in tongues? I can remember many of them would look at me and ask, in essence, ask, why in the world would you ask such a question? They didn't say it that way. Why would you ask such a question? Of course, we pray in tongues regularly in our meetings. Well, we don't do it in the United States. And discovered just about every country in Israel, uh, discovered, why well, they're all praying in tongues. I mean, this is normal for them. It's not normal in the United States. And I wouldn't say that we have an edge on things in the United States. Fear and pride are the problems. I don't know what I'm going to be saying. Fear and pride. I believe humility is the answer. So, now, apparent scriptural problems. Well, what about 
don't the scriptures plainly teach what about this, what about that? In some sense, I have covered many of them, uh, but let's, let's move on quickly. Problem number one, apparently the gifts um, are dispersed unequally throughout the body. This is 1 Corinthians 12. It's very clear. Apparently, the gifts are dispersed unequally throughout the body. That's the corporate entity. The corporate entity, the body. That's the whole globe, the body of Christ. The Christians, those who, who Christ is alive in their hearts through the indwelling Holy Spirit. They're une unequally dispersed throughout the body. So apparently, not everyone is given the gift of tongues in the sense that it is utilized in the corporate entity, the body. And the, uh, so here, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 8. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. To another, the word of knowledge. The implication is not everybody has the word of knowledge. To another, faith. To another, gifts of healings, verse 10. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, different kinds of tongues. To another, interpretation of tongues. That absolutely leaves you with the impression in the body, the functioning entity, the body, and it goes on with the elaborate discussion. Not everybody's an eye. If everybody was an eye, where's the hearing going to be? In the capital B-O-D-Y, in the, in the corporate entity, the body of Christ. Not everybody, just like not every cell in my body is a heart cell or a liver cell or a pancreas cell, it's, uh, or a lung, lung tissue. They are, because the diversity is needed. So it is in the body, there is great diversity. But for individual believers, Jesus told his disciples, and the book of Acts to me is so clear, I'm going to send you a helper. And the presenting form of the helper was tongues. This is the helper. So I could see him sitting in the upper room, waiting, and you know, they're waiting, they're waiting, they're waiting. Did I, did I think they knew they were waiting for the day of Pentecost? We don't know that for sure. They may have been, but they're waiting. It meant 50 back then, or Feast of Weeks. Uh, we associate exclusively with the Feast of with Pentecost, meaning the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. They're waiting. The helper's going to come. I wonder what the helper's going to look like. I wonder, I wonder how, what form of... He said the helper. It'd be better for us that the helper comes. I wonder, I wonder what, what it's going to look like. You know, what, what's the helper going to look like? What does it look like? It's a sound from heaven. It's a, it's a mighty, impactful thing from heaven. It's a sound of a rushing mighty wind, I believe, in the realm of the spirit realm, that that's the impact of it. Wind by faith. It's the essence of a rushing mighty wind. And uh, it filled the house where they were sitting, and there were tongues of fire, and it was tongues. It was like God, the Holy Spirit, didn't want us to miss it. And we miss it. Yes, the diversity of gifts in the body, the corporate entity, is not everyone has been gifted to function, to flow in every gift. I will hasten to say, you have in you, on you if you've been baptized with the Holy Spirit, in addition to being born again, you have the Holy Spirit. Is He limited? You mean the unlimited one who lives, who has baptized us and the unlimited one who has recreated our spirit? Is He still the unlimited one? Absolutely. How unlimited is the Holy Spirit? He raised Christ from the dead in hell. That's fairly without limitations. Can the unlimited one find expression through the years? You find a surprising number of an occasion of this, an occasion of that. But when, when it's all doctrine, when you play the game, you know the rules. So you can be a student of the rules of a game that you don't play and you don't even believe in playing, but you know the rules. And my opinion is, you don't know anything about that game. Yes, you ought to know the rules. Yes, there are rules. But by playing it, you come to all kinds of understanding that you don't have if you just know the rules. And you're against playing that game. So to me... It is not, because Paul's going to address 
He didn't say, you can't be doing this. You can't be speaking in tongues, all of you, because it's impossible, because all of you don't have this gift. That was never a point of argument. They were doing it. He acknowledged, you're doing it. Stop it. It's not right. Because they were speaking to the people when that, which wasn't planned, if you're a visitor, that wasn't planned, that was real time. Cameron is a young man, one of our teens who attends here. You, you, you'll just have to accept it. Ask somebody that you trust. If you don't know me, ask somebody that you trust. We didn't plan that. We didn't set that up. To me, that's a classic instance. The church, globally, there's a crisis that arises. All of a sudden, what do you do? You pray. If you're in trouble, you pray. Well, there's so much we don't know. So pray in tongues. The Holy Spirit knows what we need of before we ask. God knows. So, uh, problem number two. Apparently, the gifts are dispersed inequally throughout, this is a second, the church. And if you look up the word, the church, and in, in the, this is the first time it's mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12, and you look in 12, and in the number of instances where it's in chapter 14, it's the same word, ecclesia, it's the assembly. Now, this is, a, this is slightly different in that it includes, uh, uh, if you're in the body and you're in an assembly, you're in the church. Sometimes we use the word church to mean synonymous with the body, but they're being used slightly differently here, though if you're in the church, the assembly, the ecclesia, you are certainly in the body of Christ. And so the point, Paul's making the same point, as it is within the body, not everything's an eye, it's like a fundamental organ. Every, it's, it's a fundamental position resource in the body. So it is in, in application in terms of the ecclesia is that we're not, we're not all the same. And so apparently the gifts are dispersed unequally, unequally throughout the church. So apparently not everyone has the gift of tongues, which is to be utilized in the ecclesia, in the assembly, because that's the mistake they were used, they were making. They could do it. They were wrong to do what they were doing. So just quoting out of that 1 Corinthians 12, 30, do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? People who, in essence, are either being led astray or are being genuine, and they say, look, Russ, it says right there, do all speak with tongues? I mean, how much, how much clearer can that be? He said in the ecclesia in the church. And I want to say, you've got to know what the Bible says about the whole thing. Study the book of Acts and study 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 and study it enough to get a grasp of what is it really talking about and the really against tongues. In the ecclesia, no. Not everybody, that's the giftedness that they have. That doesn't mean they can't speak in tongues. That's an intercessory prayer language that's been given to them. But is being misused, they were misusing what had been given to them. Uh, so, problem number three. Apparently, the admonition to earnestly desire the best gifts may suggest tongues are not among the best of the gifts. They were encouraged to uh, pursue gifts. They were told, but the motivation is love. And Paul, in essence, was saying to them in 1 Corinthians 13, look, your problem is motivation. understanding but the basic problem is motivation your motivation is to be loved because you can do all these things but if it's not love and he gives somewhat of a definition a shaping of love in first corinthians 14 with are you doing what you're doing to edify the people who are present are you doing what you're doing because it makes you feel good does it, are you doing what you're doing because it's of such great benefit to you that even hearing it, it will be a benefit to someone else, which is a very incomplete form of, you could say, loving people. It's a very immature form of loving people. And you could say, well, their motive is good. But Paul is saying the motivation is love. Love looks for the best. Love is wanting to help. It abides. 
Uh, but earnestly, 1 Corinthians 12, 31, but earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. And the excellent way was for the motivation, the heart, the heart, uh, positioning of the heart is I'm going to walk in love and in knowledge of the use of this gift that has been given by the Holy Spirit. Problem number four, apparently tongues and prophecy would cease when the perfect came and the perfect, it is believed by many in the Western church, and the perfect is the Bible and so prophecy and tongues have ceased. Um, so, if you'll turn with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. It is believed by many that the perfect tongues have passed away. They're no longer present because the perfect has come. And the perfect is the Bible. And my, my response to them is, okay, the best way to understand something that's said in a book is to look in that book first. First look in that book. Is that explained in that book? If it's explained in the book, that's the best. Then you have the whole volume of Scripture if the subject is clearly bigger than just what that one book covers. So, in the book of 1 Corinthians, is there insight to when the perfect came? And the perfect is the Bible, so I, I want to read 1 Corinthians, where you are, stay where you are, in chapter 1. Um, that love never fails, um, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there's tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. That's a small problem that the knowledge is not gone, but the tongues and prophecy it will vanish away. For we know in part, we only understand in part, and, um, but when the perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away with. When the perfect comes, we'll no longer be in part. I see through a glass darkly that the image that you see is not complete. It's kind of dark. It's not fully recognizable. Uh, we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. And so the implication is, the face-to-face -face is looking in the scriptures, in essence, face-to-face. -face. So it's talking about the Bible. So because it's talking about the Bible, it is a problem that knowledge has not passed away, but definitely tongues and prophecy have passed away because we have the Bible. And so my response when in my own searching out of the matter, is that what it's talking about? Is the perfect talking about the Bible? So you're in 1 Corinthians uh, I thank my God concerning you, verse 1, for the grace of God which was given you in Christ Jesus, that you are enriched, I'm going to verse 5, um, that you are enriched in everything in Him, in all utterance and knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come short in no gift, so he's, he's referencing the gifts, so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what they were waiting for, is the return of Christ. Read that in different translations. It's crystal clear. It was the coming again of Christ. That's what they were waiting for. Not the scriptures, the coming again of Christ. So that you come short of no gift, especially waiting for the revelation, the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. They were admonished in 1 Corinthians 13, when the perfect has come, then what's in part is going to be done away. Well, you know, it's the mouth of two or three witnesses. I have to end here. Go to chapter 4 of 1 Corinthians, please. Chapter 4, is that aspect addressed? Chapter 4, uh, Paul was, uh, felt like he was being called into account for the stewardship of the ministry that had been assigned to him. Verse 4, let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards, verse 2, that one be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by a human spirit. In fact, I do not even judge myself. So that there reveals a tremendous amount of health that was in Paul. He was saying, have I been a good steward of the grace of God that's been given to me? And some of you, he's saying, are judging me in this. 
he's, he's, he's saying, you know, I, I don't think you ought to do that. And he said, the truth is, I'm not even bringing, in essence, and I understand this in my own self, I don't even bring uh, the, the, the final judgment against myself. You know, I have been a failure. I am a failure. I have judged myself. I've dropped the ball. I'm not being the minister that, you know, Paul was saying, <clears throat> you know, see, I don't even do that to myself. Yeah, we do that all the time. I do it a lot. You do it a lot. We judge ourselves. We bring the final condemnation. I have failed. And but notice, notice the wisdom of Paul. But with me, in verse 3, it's a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by a human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. This is in reference to stewardship. How well did he handle his stewardship? For I know of nothing against myself, yet... He said, I don't know of any accusations that could be lodged against me. For I know of nothing against myself, yet I am not justified by this. But he who judges me is the Lord. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes. Is Paul addressing till the perfect comes? Don't judge anything before the time until the Lord comes who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsel of the hearts. We see through a glass darkly. When will we see face to face? When the Lord comes. It's not talking about when the Bible comes. But if you genuinely believe that, then you will believe tongues aren't for me because the Bible has come. Therefore, tongues and prophecy have passed away. Therefore, all this prophesying that's going on is not right because it's passed away. Therefore, all this tongue stuff is not right because it's passed away. And I just want to say, that's foolish. That's not what the Bible teaches. Don't be stripped of a phenomenal aspect of the promise that Jesus died and rose from the dead to receive the poor out. Don't be stripped of it. In your own life, when in trouble, pray. If you're fighting, you understand I'm fighting spiritual warfare, pray all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Pray. Where is its... the impact of it? Where is that found? Corporately. yet it's been stripped from much of the Western church. Or it's believed in, but we're basically unbelieving believers because we don't use it. Or we don't understand, and why well, I didn't like the analogy of a game because it's not a game. But we don't understand what field we're really on. Therefore, we don't really know the rules or how to apply them because they could be so different. You apply all those things to football versus basketball versus dodgeball versus rugby. Oh, you would apply it differently. The church has been stripped of one of its greatest treasures. I'm sorry, I cannot deal with the heart of the matter, which is 1 Corinthians 14. But the Lord willing, that is my intention next week if you'll bow your heads with me.